Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Chip Over the Top Rugby Podcast. My name is Ryan, the host. If you are new here, welcome. If you've been here before, welcome back. All the good stuff before we get into it, make sure you give this video a thumbs up and subscribe below for more content. So, interesting weekend of rugby action. Round two uh, got off to a um, an interesting one. Um, lots of, obviously, controversy surrounding the weekend. It's never a weekend where there's no controversy, right? So let's quickly dive into Scotland v. France and Ireland v. Italy before we get into the main bulk of this episode, which is Wales v. England. So obviously, uh, as we know, France coming away with the win, 20 points to 16. But I personally believe, let me know your thoughts below, if Scotland was robbed. The ending of that game was pretty um, wild regarding the TMO decision. The referee was going to overturn his on-field decision of no try to a try. And then the TMO was like, no, we can't. There's not enough conclusive evidence. But if you look at that image, that's still... I'm pretty sure that ball was grounded and I can't be the only one. I feel like everybody feels like that ball was grounded. So unfortunately, France did win that game 20 points to 16. And you would have to sort of um, think that Scotland could have put that game to bed a lot earlier. France just not looking themselves at the moment. And I do believe it's because they don't have their talisman, Antoine Dupont pulling the strings in midfield between the backs and the forwards. It doesn't seem to be that continuity as previously um, from what we've seen from France, especially, you know, the France at the World Cup, for example. Um, And then moving on. So Ireland emphatically putting away Italy 36 points to nil. Yep, Italy didn't even come away with a point on the board. And it was just a complete performance from Ireland. Ireland are just being ruthless. They're taking their opportunities both in attack, defence, um, and they're, they're putting on a good performance. And you have to look at the sort of the squads on the whole. You would say that Ireland and France are sort of the more complete teams, um, the more settled of the teams. But obviously Ireland are, are just, you know, uh, a level above at this moment in time. Um, and it's going to be very interesting in two weeks' time when Wales goes to Dublin to take on Ireland. And that might actually be their toughest test, maybe. I don't know. We'll see. Obviously, France was, you know, a, a good tester for them. But Wales are, Wales are looking promising, but still a few errors there. So let's dive in then to Wales v England. Before I do that, like I said, make sure you give this video a thumbs up and subscribe below for more content. I will give a little background, though, a little update for you. I do have to go home um, This week, actually, I'm heading home on Saturday and I will be in the UK, in Wales, up until Sunday, the 25th of Feb. And there's a possibility that I can get over to Ireland, maybe, and watch the game. So that would be pretty fucking cool. But unfortunately, the circumstances of me going home is to attend a funeral, um, which is never the best. But it is what it is, unfortunately. So, yeah, I'll be home um, and hopefully get to, like I said, maybe go to the island game uh, and, and do some behind-the-scenes stuff there. But we'll see. That is a big if. So, Wales v England. Man, what a game. Um, completely different game from Wales v Scotland uh, the week prior. I do believe that, you know, both teams were kind of nervy, right? Um, both in similar situations, rebuilding, but also slightly different rebuilding phases. I feel like England has more depth of experience compared to sort of the Welsh squad, but that's, you know, that's that's going to be part and parcel of it, right? That's going to be England within the next year or two anyway. So Wales are just restarting that process slightly earlier with sort of the wider squad that they've picked. In terms of caps, if you look at the cap range um, across the, the spectrum, Wales, you know, on the bench, they didn't really have many caps to bring on compared to like England. If you look at the front row, for example. But anyway, let's dive in. England beating Wales 16 points to 14. Um, And some described it as England's experience off the bench just thwarted um, the resilience of the Welsh. And yeah, they just suffocated Wales in that regard. So let's take a look. I do believe it was a nervy start for both teams. If you if you want to look at it in, in general, if you look at the highlights, a lot of ball was played in the Welsh half within that first sort of 15, 20 minutes. If you look at the possession and everything like that. Um, and it didn't really start to go well until, I guess, the 10 minute mark. 
um, scrum the line out, and then uh, Wales, you know, they wanted to play wide, so they were showing some intent. Uh, they wanted to run from deep, which was good. It was just unfortunately they didn't. Um, maybe Dyer didn't give the pass quick enough to win it, and Dyer, you know, well, he didn't pass. He just got caught on the twenty-two, but it could have been a little bit different. Um, and you have to ask yourself, you know, maybe if we kick from deep and there was a good chase, if we had someone like Zamet out there, maybe he would have got on a lucky bounce and could have could have ran in from our own half. But there we go. Um, yeah, so a nervy start. Obviously, then the 10 minute mark, that sort of intent to play was there from Wales. You could kind of see it. And then on the 12 minute mark, there was the yellow card to Ollie Chesham. Uh, a little bit unfortunate. Um, you know, Kiwan Azarati was dipping and he was already being tackled. And then, but, you know, Oli Chesham is a tall guy. He, he has to, do, you know, go lower if he can. I know it's difficult when you're that tall and there's such a big height difference, but that's the rules of the game these days. Um, so, yeah, yellow card on the 12 minute mark. And then, uh, and then it sort of became a bit of uh, in favour for Wales. Wales got a very good uh, penalty and Johan Lloyd with a fantastic kick, to be fair, to the corner. And we'll get on individual performances after I just go through a little rundown of sort of how the game went. But yeah, fantastic touch finder. Um, and then that rolling more from the lineup was just wild. It was, it was good to see. And then obviously another yellow card, penalty try, Ethan Roots going off, collapsing the rolling more that you could see. Um, and penalty try 7-0 to Wales at that point. Um, but And so here's, here's where I was like, this is a bit shitty, right? Because... England were down to 13 men. They managed to get back into the Welsh um, 22. Uh, there was a scrum scrum penalty. Well, scrum, a little bit scrappy. Ewan Lloyd, not entirely sure what to do. He was looking to run from the 22, where he should have probably just cleared it. If you were a more experienced fly half, you would have done that, rather than trying to run from your 22. But I can understand, again, he's showing his intent. He wants to attack, right? We're in our 22. We're down they're down, England are down two players, we have a two-man overlap, let's give it a go. He doesn't, unfortunately, he gets caught by a Toje, that leads to an England penalty, which, uh, sorry, an England scrum, which leads to the Ben Earls try, and again, that try should not have happened uh, if he had cleared his, his lines from the offset, but also then, if he was a bit more abrasive in defence, you know, if that was Dan Bigger, I don't think, you know, Ben Earl would have scored that. Uh, if it was Costello, maybe not either. Johan Lloyd just maybe needs to be a bit more upfront with his defence and his tackles there. But anyway, uh, Ben will score the try. Uh, and uh, obviously George Ford doesn't, doesn't convert because of the little shot clock thing, right? He makes a slight move. And a lot of people were confused by that. But I get it. He was set for a long time. And he... I know the shot clock was still there and he technically hadn't finished setting, but it was such a long pause between his first initial set and then his side step to the left. That looked like an initial movement and therefore that sort of went in Wales' favour. Uh, unfortunate for George Ford and England there, but 7-5 Wales. And then it wasn't really anything then until the 38th minute uh, with an absolute cracker from Alex Mann. Um, you know, just popping it back inside. Raphael with the break, back inside to Thomas Williams. Alex Mann as a good flanker in support. Boom, try time, Wales. Fantastic score. That was a brilliant try, actually. Um, I was thoroughly enjoyed with that one. And then there was nothing really happening in the first sort of 15 minutes. Again, a little bit of nervy start. Um, and then, yeah, on the 55th minute mark, Johan Lloyd passes it to win it with an absolute Perler of a line. He cuts through the England line um, out to Adams. Adams does a little, you know, does very well, gets into the 22. Probably could have passed it earlier, maybe cut back inside. He offloaded the Dyer. Unfortunately, Dyer knocks it on. Um, and that was a massive missed opportunity there. Uh, on the 62nd minute mark, England try Wales were just way, way too narrow. And people were asking online why, for example, why did Mason Grady get a yellow card? Uh, again, it's too narrow. They're defending narrow. And the reason why they're defending narrow, in my opinion, is because you just look at the size of the 10 and 12 that Wales had on that field. Johan Lloyd's not massive. Uh, Nick Tompkins, yeah, he's great in defense, but, you know, too small. 
opportunities. So you have to have you have to bring in George North, and obviously at that point Mason Grady was on the field, and so again you have to bring them in narrow to be able to defend the crash ball through 10-12 opportunity, and that is why you kind of saw Cam win it, uh, hanging back a little bit, but he was isolated by himself. So uh, unfortunately, yeah, Wales defending too narrow. England try in the corner. Happy days, you know. Um, and then on the 70th minute, again, similar scenario. England pinned down into Welsh 22. Again, narrow defence. You look at how it was. Mason Grady was very, very close. Um, they were defending so narrow. Cam Winnett was way back on his own. Um, and if that ball went, you know, it would have been a try anyway. Should they have maybe just let it happen in that, in that instance so that we don't get a yellow card? Uh, you know, you can't, you know, it is what it is. It's happened now. But yeah, again, narrow defense. Um, and, and I think that's not necessarily, that's probably experience, right? That's, that's not trusting your inside man to make the hit, make the tackle. Um, and, and yeah, Mason Grady, yellow card. And unfortunately, uh, England capitalize, get the penalty, um, which takes it up to 16 points. Um, but yeah. It was a good game overall. I was obviously disappointed being Welsh and whatnot. And just looking at it, I do believe there were options to win that game. And you kind of have to look at it um, from a Welsh person's standpoint. There are some big talking points, right? There are. Like, okay, first talking point. Let me know your thoughts below here. Uh, Ryan Elias, again, inconsistency with the line out. Like, you don't take off two of your best sort of performers off the bench in the Scotland game early in this game and I get it I understand why they did it they need to blood sort of Archie Griffin Archie Griffin could have maybe come on but would you have kept Dion I think so because uh you know it was just a line out again Ryan Elias is great around the field and he's a good overall scrummager but when it comes to line out throwing and just the pressure there he sometimes buckles under that pressure and I know it's not everybody's fault you can't pinpoint it on one person but it's twice now in two weeks where Ryan Elias is line out throwing and just the line out in general hasn't functioned when he's been on the field. So we need to look at that because you need someone reliable to come on. And it wasn't just one line out. It was a couple, right? So you need someone to come on off the bench who can do that. So, you know, that's a talking point. You bring on Archie Griffin, uh, uh, you know, on the run of the, you know, in the 50th minute mark, 55th minute mark. And, but then England bring on Ellis Genge and Dan Cole. It's going to be fucking tough. It is going to be tough for any new front rower to, you know, go up against Genge and Dan Cole, who are very, very experienced players in their own right. Another talking point was why Tompkins was crash balling, not George North. And again, I think it's just to be able to sort of use North as a second battering ram to hold. And I know of Wales of old, you do have a, a big ball carrying 12. Jamie Roberts, for example, uh, Hadley Parks, right? And, uh, and I think it's just sort of the style that Wales are having to play. You know, Nick Tompkins does offer some... Sometimes it works, right? Sometimes he crash balls and he can get it off around the back to North. Um, but when North had a couple runs in that game, he, he made some good yardage. He had a couple good runs. Um, so, yeah. And then, so just overall, you know, how the England blitz D, the defence, there was nothing really that Wales could do. There was a couple back inside balls which worked uh, obviously led to the man try and George North had a couple of bumbling runs and obviously win it you know with that beautiful line through the gap there um, was able to sort of you know create some opportunity but there wasn't just enough power I don't think to to handle that sort of instant blitz that England offered and gave so it was very difficult to get on the front foot um, when you you know you're taking a pass at a standstill, there wasn't really anybody who could kind of bust through, and Wales are kind of missing those big ball carriers. So it'll be interesting to see um, what the squad selection will be for Wales v Ireland. And then finally, I think another sort of talking point that I want to discuss is our number ten option, Ewan Lloyd. All hats to him. You know he did have uh, he wanted to attack from deep. He wanted to play wide. He wanted to play. But that blitz defense and that coming up quick didn't really allow him to do that. Um, and there was a couple instances, you know, like I said, where he wanted to play from deep and, and he got caught by a Toje. 
Uh, there was a couple line out kicks that didn't quite go as far as like I feel like if Bigger was on the field or Costello maybe, you know, he could they could have probably added on 10, 15 meters extra into that line out. And then he just wanted to, you know, get it off the park, make sure that, you know, we got the ball back for our line out. But going forward, sort of, do you stick with, with Lloyd? Do you maybe want to see what sort of a Kai Evans can do? Obviously, he came on, you know, right at the end there. But... Um, didn't really do much, obviously. He only was on the field for a couple minutes. So let me know below, like, what would you do? What would you What would you do? Obviously, would you maybe go to Ireland and be like, all right, we're in this position now. We want to we wanna have an attack. We want to have a go. But do you give someone like Evan Lloyd an option off the bench, start D maybe? Um, do you bring in probably like Dylan Lewis um, as a tie head option? Probably. To bring on that experience. You just need to bring on that experience. And that's why I was thinking, you know, maybe we... And I didn't know how George North was fantastic. But maybe you look at starting a Mason Grady and bringing on North towards the, you know, the 60-minute mark or the 50-minute mark to bring on that experience. Let Mason Grady have a run on the wing because he needs it. Uh, it's it, it, Mason Grady hasn't really had the opportunity to show... He's been caught twice, two yellow cards that he's, you know, come on, you know, in the World Cup and whatnot. And so it's been very, very disappointing um, of an international career for Mason Grady thus far. So, yeah, uh, it is what it is at the end of the day, right? Wales, two losses from two on three points, though, from three bonus points, which could which could prove uh, beneficial as we head towards the tail end of this tournament for the Six Nations. But anyway, yeah, fantastic game overall. Fantastic weekend of rugby. Um, I'm, lo- I'm really looking forward to Ireland v Wales and the possibility of me being able to go. So that would be great. That'd be great content for me. It'll just be the day uh, up and down in the same day. So that'd be pretty, pretty intense. And I'll fly home on a Sunday if that is an option. But we'll see. Anyway, all the good stuff, ladies and gentlemen. Dio Chum Thank you very much. Like and follow for more. Subscribe. You know what to do. Peace.